this class. Um, let's start out. Um, let's start out in Philippians in our basic scriptures. <clears throat> Philippians chapter two. And I had made the statement real quick at the end of the class, uh, last class, that uh, I read this one. The glory of Jesus' nature or his character was far above any glory Jesus had by title or by position. And it's a pretty wild statement to make on one hand, but if you will notice... Um, the scriptures here in Philippians, it begins to describe the glory of Jesus by nature and by character, and it ends with the glory, what we call official glory, the glory that Jesus had by title and position. So I want you to try to follow that. I want you to see the progression, how it begins with the glory of nature, and it ends with the glory of title and position. Verse 6, uh, Philippians 2, who being in the form of God thought it not a thing to be grasped after, to be equal with God, but emptied himself, made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Okay, all that dealing with nature and character and uh, humility and that sort of thing. And then verse 9, wherefore? Wherefore? Now, notice that it, in none of those verses did it say Jesus became an offering for sin. That it's not talking about a work. That's my point. It's not talking about the work that Jesus did to save the world. It's not talking about that at all. It's talking about the work that had to be done in him or the reality of his nature and character that had to be, yes, that would, would accomplish those things. But now we're getting to the, the core. Now we're getting to the central focus. Uh, and I say that because it's a very important point that will come up over and over again. Um, with every, uh, I'll draw a circle up here on the board, with every uh, circumference, there has to be a center. And the, the circumference being all of the things that surround this reality and we've and and in that you know in that you could make it even like a pie if you wanted to do it that way or you could put those things on the outer border of that thing uh, all of the different categories that all the different areas and categories dividing the pie up until one focuses on this area of the gospel and another focuses on this area, and another Jesus did this, and this was accomplished, and all of that. But in this, in all of these pieces of pie, and all of the things that are met on the edge of this circumference that's going around here, there is a center point. There is a center point. And that center point is that the true nature of the cross is not just dying on a cross because two men on either side of him died on a cross. And that the cross is not simply comprehended in two pieces of wood. But in the nature of the one who died. The selflessness. Now you're coming to the center. Now you're coming to where all of those things in the circumference find their core, find their meaning, find their unifying uh, aspect 
that unifies them all if you comprehend that core thing. If you don't, then what is it? <clears throat> well, my God. Then it's then Christianity and th theology is a massive amount of material from righteousness to, to family relations to all of them not having a true center and yet the core, the core nature, the core reality, the, the selflessness of that nature being the reason for every bit of it. And you take that out of it and you just got good families and there are good people who don't even know the Lord. You know that? Do you know that there are families that live better than your family? Yeah. They don't even know the Lord. Um, and there are, as I've said many times before, there are Buddhists who are way more humble than you. And so... Uh, and so there is no virtue in any virtue unless selflessness be at the core of it. Humility for humility's sake. No. Love for love's sake. No. There has to be a unifying concept. There has to be that thing that makes it all tick. And that was the that's always been the confusing thing to me because, you know, uh, when I first got saved, somehow I ended up with a Schofield Bible, and I know that there are people who believe as we do that would just cringe at the fact that I would even read a Schofield Bible because of all of its certain things that it talks about. But that was the Bible I ended up with, and it's full of notes. And, it, you know, if you go to the back and you flip through the section where it has the notes, my gosh, it's got all of these subjects and everything, and then it's got a blurb usually somewhere in this thing where you can look it up and read it, and it was a massive amount of material that I thought, I'll never get all this down. I mean, does anybody feel that way? That just the scope of all of the different subjects, you know, I drew a pie up here with three or four pieces, you know, innumerable things to lay hold of, to, to grasp, to grasp so that we can flow with it. And yet, deep within my being, I felt like that there had to be more than just a million subjects. Didn't make sense to me. God, God, God who is three, but he's one. Three who is one. That made sense to me. I, that doesn't make sense to most people, but that made sense to me because the three were one, and maybe it's because I'm so dumb. Maybe it's because I'm so simple. But to find three that are actually one and that the reality of the three is the one, the one what? The one person? No. Not the one person. I mean, print, speaking by principle, I'm shaking Christian denominations by saying that. Not the person. Whether it be you or God or anybody else, not the person. The unifying fact is not the person because the person is the Father and the Son is not the Father. And the Father is not the Holy Spirit in person. Differences. Differences. And yet, when I heard it was three and one, that bore witness, though I didn't know, I, I didn't know where that would take me. I know where it's taking me now. I didn't know where it would take me. But I knew in my being and in my core, this is the truth. This is the truth of all truth. There is one thing, and, and probably not this course. I'll, I'll try to end this right now. I'm, some other course coming up soon. God has just opened <laughs> quantum mechanics to me and a bunch of other stuff along this line that, that I'd love to share with you <clears throat> that are all based on this principle. 
um, that is vast amounts of reality and material that can be reduced down to one unifying theory that guides it all. So anyway, so sticking with this then, a circumference has to have a center. If that's all you understood, you know, well, I don't really get this here uh, geometry stuff or, you know, if all you ever got out of it was every circumference has to have a center and all that surrounds, circumference, surrounding, surrounds it, all that surrounds it has one center. Even if you didn't know what that center was, if you believed the concept and sought after it, it would lead you to that which joins it all together. This nature, this being of God, whatever, whatever term you want to use, because it's not, it's not God the personality that counts, ultimately. It's God the being. And what does that mean? Or more specifically, who is that? And who is that in terms of definition of that being? And as you begin to know him, we talk about knowing him all the time, don't we? As you begin to know him, you begin to know all things. You know all things by Christ. There's a, it's either, I think it's a proverb that basically says that, except it doesn't use Christ. But you will know all things by Christ. You'll know, you'll truly know them, but you cannot know them without knowing the center. Not fully. Because you don't know what makes it tick. And the center many times is invisible. And I, now I'm talking beyond quantum mechanics, astrophysics, uh, sociology, uh, on and on and on. The unifying factor, when you get down to it, is not as evident as the manifestation. We see the manifestation first, or the manifestations. And we examine, like in sociology or any, in, any, other, any other field, just pick the field, we examine to understand, we examine the manifestation. And the manifestations have laws pertaining to them. Again, talking, you know, quantum mechanics or, or, or any of those fields. Um, they, the manifestations have laws of their being. And so we discover that. We, we, we study that. And in studying it, we think we have it because we see the laws of that. For example, a tree, if you examine the leaf, there are laws of osmosis and of, of all of the factors of how it works and everything like that. And by understanding the laws of that thing and how sun actually from the outside is having this effect and is accomplishing certain things and then eventually through that, those leaves bringing forth oxygen and getting rid of carbon dioxide. Well, what a glorious thing, but you have not understood the, the tree, much less the roots, much less the seed by understanding that. You've seen the laws. You've studied it. You know it better than I know it. but is not the same law or the same reality or the same center at work in the bark and the branches and the brown as well as the green or apple tree, the, the red? Well, the apple 
draws its red from this, this, and this. The trees have green leaves because of this, this, and this. The bark is brown because of this, this, and this. All of it true, none of it taking you to the center. None of it revealing what's hidden in the roots. None of it. And yet all of it lives because of what's hidden. So, it is, th this, these areas are just, have been huge to me for years and years. And um, <laughs> to prove my point, uh, I have uh, been studying quantum mechanics. There's a, there's a website called Academic Earth where you can download video classes from Harvard and Yale and MIT and Stanford, the best schools in the nation, where I could test my theory that if what I'm saying is right, then all of those things will find a, find a focus somewhere else. And in fact, in quantum mechanics, that's exactly what they're trying to do right now. It's, it was what uh, um, uh, Einstein died trying to prove the unifying theory. He died with that. And he believed it all came back down to one. Well, I knew, I know it does. I saw that from the Lord. And I believe that one will be found in the person, but not the person being the, the theory, or the, 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 the unifying theory, but the nature of the person. Fulfilling all parts and making all parts what they are regardless of their individual laws that that govern them so sorry to get off on all that i'm so full of this and i haven't shared with anybody and when i start talking about quantum physics my wife goes what the did you talk but it's it's just fascinating to me and i really really honestly hope that i'll be able to share a bunch of this not Probably shouldn't have exploded this early, but I, I'm just, I'm just incredibly enjoying this. I mean, they're they are totally off now, not off in a bad way, but off on a whole new theory beyond atoms. It's called string theory, and uh, and I think I think they're on to something, but I think they're missing something too. But anyway, I uh, if if these things are true then they will come down to their center and the center will prove their being. Anyway, sorry. <clears throat> All right. Um, <laughs> really? Oh, man, I'm telling you, I'm having so much fun. And I have been for some time now, for several years, but I, uh, these new courses have been a real blessing, you know. I was thinking, you know, I'm going to watch this first video from Harvard, you know, I'm thinking, <laughs> this guy don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> not, in a, not in a superior sort of way, but that he's not, he's not bringing things, you know, and, and of course, when you start off, you don't. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And um, so, I don't know. Anybody be interested in me sharing on this sometime? It would take me quite a while to do it. It's, not, it's actually not one class, but it's just, it's not as hard as you think. And here's the, the key that I saw was what applies to quantum mechanics applies to sociology, applies to, I'm trying to think of all the different aspects uh, applies to anatomy and physiology, applies to, I mean, I just kept going and going. I kept, as I studied, I said, okay, and it started crossing boundaries. It started crossing subjects. And I'd really like to just tell you right now how I made that leap from the, out of the word where I came up with that idea. But it's there, and it proves out, and it goes back to the center of all subjects. They all have a reality to it. But they're all without reality if you don't know the center. And so, anyway, God, stop! All right. <clears throat> um, so, 
what I got into that was showing that verses uh, uh, 6 through 8 are simply dealing with Jesus in nature, not what he accomplished, not the salvation of the world, not doing some great thing uh, for somebody, but rather him, just humbling, just becoming small, excuse me, just becoming small and just becoming uh, this because of his nature. He doesn't feel it a thing to be grasped after to be seen as equal with God, okay? And that that spirit, excuse me, is at work in him, wherefore God has given official glory. Wherefore God gives him title and position. Because of that, this, that's the key to all study. <laughs> because of that, this. All right. Anybody ever remember a time when you were a new Christian or old Christian, I don't know, and you read the scripture and it says, we shall reign with him and uh, uh, unto you I will give ten kingdoms and unto you I will give, anybody ever read that? And did anybody think, praise God, I'm going to get to rule over kingdoms and people and stuff like that. Anybody think that and get like real excited that the possibility of something like that? I remember reading that for the first time and thinking, my God, we're all in trouble if we're going to turn these people loose, you know? You know, I mean, that, 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 that God's not thinking this through. <laughs> and so, um, uh, you know, the, we just think that, here's the deal, we think we earn title and position. And we think we earn it by doing certain things. And you didn't do it, so you didn't earn it, but I did it, so I earned it. Do you, are you following what I'm saying? Jesus didn't do certain things. He be something. Sorry, I grew up in Oak Cliff. Was, what you be, man? <laughs> you got a solid dime? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, and, and it is a being thing that manifests in a certain way. That's not doing, although the, the doing proves the being. So he marks the doing because the, the center is many times invisible. Many times is invisible, not discoverable, until you follow it out. And so, one day reading this, when I saw the wherefore, it blew my mind. It took me to realms I could not believe because I saw that this was not based on Jesus, the Son of God. This was this wherefore thou art hardly exalted and given a name above every name that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. That's pretty big stuff. That's, that's better than giving you ten kingdoms or five kingdoms. That's every knee in heaven and earth and under the earth. And, and then if you ask the question, you look at Jesus and you see every knee in things in heaven and earth and under the earth. Wherefore? Oh, Romeo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wherefore is that? Why is that? You know, a lot of Shakespeare coming out of me lately, too. What is up with that? Um, William Blake, that's my, that's my poet, not Shakespeare. Um, where do you get that? Where, why is that? Wherefore marks uh, the trail, and if you don't go back and find the being, you won't find the manifestation. And if you don't go back and find the root, you won't find the fruit. And if you don't find the glory of nature, you'll never find true official glory. Not by God. But he has no problem giving official glory to one such as verse 6 through 9. He just has no problem with that. No fear, no doubt, no worries. He is secure 
He can rest in his love. He can rest in this, this situation. <clears throat> Dang. Um, so let me just read, maybe, because I'm really... The Son of Man, the Son of Man was exalted, not the Son of God. This is the exaltation of the Son of Man, not the Son of God. Okay. This is the firstborn. This is the prototype of what will come. This is the first fruit of what will be a harvest. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him. He's the root. He's the seed from which everything will spring. <clears throat> um, he was given that place as a man. He was given that place based on his nature and not based on his merit due to being God or being the best manager. Because it, it, interesting, it didn't say um, Jesus, you know, really handled problems well. And Jesus really could uh, control himself in the sense of when he got angry. And Jesus could fix issues when they came up. Think of that. Think of that. Think of that. None of these things refer to being the best manager, and yet he makes him the best, he makes him the highest manager. Do you understand what I'm saying? Highly exalted, he makes him the highest manager, not based on his managerial skills, but based on his spirit. Praise God. I mean, it's just, it, it's mind-boggling to follow these things out and to find the true source of them. Um, all right, in the last class we were talking about this offering, Christ as man being the embodiment of the offering that God wanted and bringing mankind into that or making, bringing them into being the living sacrifice. Uh, what flowed from the Lord was the fruits of his nature. He was offering up this sweet nature as an offering of man or humanity unto God. That's important. He was offering this as a offering of man or an offering of humanity. Offerings came out of the earth. The first fruits came out of the earth. You have to see that, that that's this whole beauty of this new kind of man. <clears throat> um, and I, let me read one scripture, and I just can't linger. But Ephesians 5 and verse 1 and 2. Now listen, instead of looking at it, just listen to this. Be ye, therefore. Didn't tell you to do anything. Be ye, therefore, followers of God as dear children. Don't follow God as a disciple in the sense of what we think disciple. Follow him as a seed. Follow him as the same seed, the same DNA, the same lineage. How about this? The same species of mankind. That's the kind. Well, that's different than somebody giving instruction, a religious convert following. You understand what I'm saying? A religious convert that follows doesn't have it in them like DNA. Okay? And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us. Okay? But given himself for us how? an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Remember how we started last class with Noah and God smelled the sweet savor of it? This scripture proves that the true sweet savor sacrifices, the true sweet savor offerings of the Old Testament are fulfilled in how we live out according to this nature of love or God. God is love. Love is kind. Love is patient. 
kind, patient, uh, long-suffering, all of those things, manifestations of a nature. What nature? God's nature. Described how? Love. God is love. You know, God is not patience. God is love, but love is patience. All the laws fulfilled in this, love, okay? God's nature, God's true nature, God, the true core, the true center, whatever term you want to use it, lamb, love, da-da-da-da, it's all this self-giving. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself unseemly. You see? And so, um, and so he says, walk in the same manner that Christ did, who gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. And those two verses have absolutely nothing to do with doing that to save people, doing that to earn anything, doing that as an offering that will get you favor, it has everything to do with just being according to this nature, according to this new species, and let it manifest as it will, and it'll be a sweet-smelling savor, not because of any work. He doesn't have to describe a specific work or a specific how-to. There's no how-to on nature. It is its how-to. Okay. So... Are we, are, is anybody in this room yet completely conformed to the image of Christ? Okay. Well, we understand that. We understand that. If you look at you, you will fall down in a heap and want to quit. Am I right? If you look at him, there's hope. Because he is your hope. He's not your hope giver. And he doesn't give you hope. He is your hope because he's the fulfillment of the very things you would like to see coming out of you. So there is hope. 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 And Christ is my hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every expression of himself was well-pleasing because it was an expression of himself. Um, here's, the, here's the explanation. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave. Now, what I get from that is love is tied with God somehow in self-giving, right? For God so loved he gave. Okay. Love... Let's be more specific from other scriptures. God is love, so God so loved, or God lives in such a manner according to his nature that he gives. That's the definition. Okay. While it goes on to talk about salvation, you have just discovered the seed of all actions. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay, I just sat down. I hope your video cameras. La, 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 la. Um, well, if we are self-centered, if we are self-focused, we will see John 3.16 as simply God loving me so much that he died. Or we will simply see that we were saved from his action. But if you compare 1 John, or you compare John 3.16 with 1 John 3.16, by this perceive we the love of God because he gave. By this perceive we the love of God because he gave. There's nature, there's core, there's, there's the center, and every circumference has a center, regardless of the subject. And Christ in nature is the center of this one. By this perceive we the love of God because he gave himself for us and we ought to give ourselves 
for the brethren. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Okay. So, Jesus walked in this sweet savor. And God continually smelled it. And God glories in that selfless nature. <clears throat> All right. Because of the preciousness of this offering, those who would be joined in him would reach higher heights than they would had they stayed innocent in Adam. And, and this is... This is uh, simply you consider the Garden of Eden and you consider what Adam and Eve had, sinlessness, perfect conditions. But God doesn't bring us back to the garden. Well, he does, but not that garden. <laughs> he brings us to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there in the Garden of Gethsemane, we are joined to him because we had to be made one somewhere. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, not my will. And there, I, I believe, he, the high priest laid hands on the lamb. And the high priest imparted, and the lamb said, not my will, but thine be done. And he was sweating great drops of blood and wrestling with this whole thing because he was going to become one with us. And there's no uglier, more horrible thing that could come on him than that. And that's just a fact. There's nothing worse that could happen. <clears throat> Once it's settled, I'm a willing sacrifice. He's one with us. He takes us to the cross. Before the lamb was slain, hands were laid on it. There was an impartation of sins and the sinner and all that. Then it died on the altar. Okay? <clears throat> and so um, in that death and in that resurrection, we are not just uh, forgiven or forgiven and forgotten and talk, took back to the Garden of Eden. We are made sons of God. We are family. We are DNA. We are one. We are accepted, but only in union with the beloved. <clears throat> and um, so it is a fuller, brighter relationship with God through Christ than Adam could ever have given us. Hallelujah. What is the brightness of it? The sun, the center, the focus. I mean, the earth going around in its orbit, making the circumference, never fulfilling the fullness of the center, which is the sun. The circumference is not it. The sun is the center focus of it all. <clears throat> the earth is not it. Jesus is all it. You're not it. He is the fulfillment of all those things. <clears throat> so, um, well, I really do need to finish this section. Jesus restored God's desire back toward man because soon after man's failure, God had repented that he had made man. Remember in Genesis, the, the Noah story? It repented God that he had made him on the earth. And Jesus has as this first fruits, as this new man, as this prototype restores God's desire back towards man. He'd left it. He'd forsaken that desire. He had no desire toward man anymore in that sense. <clears throat> Concerning man, every imagination of his heart was evil only. It did not take man long to thoroughly ruin the beauty of God's creation. But Jesus was a great contrast in his nature compared to all other men. Now God delights in this offering out from the earth. That's the point of being man. There is an offering coming out from the earth unto him. And it's a sweet savor. And all of his desire is renewed. And all of his latent um, uh, hopes and dreams for man is being manifested in that one man. 
and the hope for greater than one rests in that seed dying to bring forth more of the same. And uh, so to him, the earth is finally bringing forth that which brings pleasure and rest to his heart. He, um, Jesus said this, God hath given me a commandment that I may lay down my life or may take it again. Did you know that? God told Jesus, look, you don't have to die. <laughs> That's pretty amazing when you think about it. He said, you can lay it down or you can take it. It's up to you. Well, he sort of had an inside track because he knew the nature of this man. He knew that the very nature was to give itself. He knew that Jesus could go rogue on him. He could. He could, he could go with his feelings. He could go with his soul. But he was right smack dab in the middle of the plan of God. He was on a mission. And, and being ever mindful of that mission, regardless of the cost to him, he could not violate that. So he said, I can take my life or I can lay it down, whatever, whatever. So here is my will, not my will. Well, that's the death of his will because when he said not my will I mean you can read that in two different ways one is that he didn't want to do what God wanted to do based on the pulls and the pressures and the temptations so I won't go with my will so that's not just not going with it that's the death of my will I die to my will thine be done now didn't he pretty much live that way but he did that in the little things so that when it came to the big one, it was easier. You know, if you do, do the little things all along every day and little things, when you get to the big one, it's not like this mammoth mountain that you can't climb. If you're not doing those in little things every day, then when you get to that, it will overwhelm you. If you are doing those things, then it's like David, first came the bear, then the lion, then Goliath. You take bigger and bigger chunks until you're able to handle it by life, by Christ. An increase of Christ is taking place. And in, in, in this case, Jesus was, it says, I, you know, what is it over in John 8, I think? I do always those things that please the Father. So now's the big test. <laughs> Not my will, but thine be done. It just, it just comes. All right, let me see if I can wrap this up here. After Jesus was glorified because of his selflessness as a man, then he would also enter into the glory that was his as son of God also. And then uh, let me go ahead and, and just give you, a, I think it's just one paragraph in relationship to the temptations of Christ uh, in Matthew 4, 1 uh, through 11 there. And we won't even take the time to read it because I, I don't want to go long. But it's, you know, where Jesus was, was tempted of the devil. <clears throat> Jesus was human in that he felt pulls and pains. Do you agree with that? He had a soul. He had a body. He was human in that he felt pulls and pains, but he was divine or pure gold in nature. Uh, one of the things I never got to share that I saw when I was talking about the, uh, and I hadn't really finished that sharing on Sundays, but the one about the habitation of God was this beautiful, incredible, beautiful, incredibly beautiful reality that I saw one day when I was searching uh, 
when I was searching within Solomon's temple, and that's the way I describe it because my search is never academic in a book. I put myself in there, and then I examine those things. And I, so I'm reading, of course, walking through Solomon's temple, and I realize that all of the stones and everything, everything in there is covered with pure gold. Now that wasn't the case. You know, even the, bra even the brazen altars, and they had a bunch of them after that point, covered with gold. And I'm looking at this, and I'm looking at those stones, particularly, I mean, like really looking at them because I'm realizing that, that we're, we're the fulfillment of those stones. We're the living stones. And the, we've all been covered over with the divine nature. That's what gold represents, pure gold. And that all that God sees is Jesus. And this is the place he lives. This is his habitation. And he just, you know, we're aware of hardness and stuff yet. But he's aware, the father is aware of his son. <clears throat> anyway, so he was divine or pure gold in nature. The devil tempted Jesus using all his wiles that have worked on men forever, <laughs> all men, that have worked on men due to their inner corruptions from the fall. Before Jesus could start his ministry of rebuking the devil and others, he had to show that the enemy had no place in him. Does that sound good? I mean, it, it's right in the sense of we give him no place. So when you say to the enemy, we give you no place in them, he knows you mean it. You don't listen to the devil when it's convenient, but give him no place on the stuff that you really could care less about. You know, If it's the devil, I don't care what he's coming, what he's bringing on a silver platter. I don't want anything to do with it. Why? Not because I, don't, I wouldn't enjoy what he's, but I know the source and I give you no place. <clears throat> um, gave no place. Uh, he had to show the enemy that he had no place in him. He was the father's. And that's the way he responds. You know, it's the father's. It's the father. I mean, you know, if you look at the temptations there, he keeps referring back to the father's. In Matthew 12, 29, the devil was bound in that his hands were tied. And remember it says, uh, you should bind the devil and spoil the strong man. That's, you know, stuff like the devil was bound in that his hands were tied. Without us having a fallen nature, Satan is powerless. Jesus bound him by not being of this world. By this method, he enters into the devil's house, he enters into the strong man's house and spoils his goods. He takes away the ground. We were his house. If you think about it. See, we would never say that in those scriptures, but we were the enemy's house. And now he's taken away that ground and spoiling the goods within the house. <clears throat> Jesus doesn't spoil the strong man by making the devil weak. He removes the ground in us. Jesus put away the sin nature by the sacrifice of himself where it was crucified at the cross. We, we read those scriptures. says, Jesus took away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Are you familiar with those scriptures? Jesus took away sin by the sacrifice. Jesus put away the sin nature because the word sin there is sin nature. It's just not translated out. It is sin nature, not sins. Jesus put away the sin nature by the sacrifice of himself where it was crucified at the cross. He overcame the world. Definition of overcoming the world, refu refusing all its attractions and offers. Okay, so this, this man is different. He's different. It's completely different from the other mankind. And the mankind that he brings into being has, is inlaid even from within with gold. 
And each stone says, not I, but Christ. And so they are overlaid with gold, not seen anymore, not counted in, only that which is their life and their, their substance as they reckon themselves through oneness with this new man. And so all, all things for each of those stones leaves all of the issues, all of the portions within the pie, and all the subjects. And it begins to find the core of all things. It begins to realize that the core of that is Christ must live in every part. That's what makes us his habitation. That's what makes us a different man. That's what made me a different man than what I was. And I, you know, I have old friends who maybe question that. Not because of things, just because they knew what I was like before. But I have a father, and I know that I am not the same man that I was. And I know that because what comes out of me emanates from his spirit, his being, and it, and it slaps me on the hand when I would try to reach forth to the altar of incense. So don't touch that. That's not yours. That's not your place. You know. And says, let my son accomplish it or don't or be satisfied that it'll never be accomplished. All right, so let me just end with this then. Sure, there's stuff you want to see accomplished in you or in someone else, your boss or your wife, or your husband or your kids or something. Sure. But can you be satisfied to wait on the Lord to allow him to do that and not get impatient with him and to move from impatience to trust that says not only not my will but not my timing but thine be done hmm. it's a good year of rest we got here don't be striving don't be hating. <laughs> Don't be striving. Trust the Lord. Allow the Lord to do it. Father, we ask you to give us the peace that passes understanding. We didn't ask you to straighten out our understanding so we would be peaceful. We ask you to give us the peace that passes understanding and the patience to wait on you and to trust you so that what is accomplished is you and not us. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.